All right, it looks like it is three o'clock. So I'm gonna go ahead and start. I just wanna welcome everyone. Um, I'm David Tanner, for those who don't know. Uh, I'm the Dean for Arts and Cultural Resources here at Albright College. Uh, and I just wanna thank everyone who's joined us today. Uh, if you are just joining us, um, we have two panelists with us today. Uh, Steve Rossi is our artist uh, whose work has just been installed in the Friedman Gallery. And he's here today to talk about uh, that work. Um, he's also invited a friend and colleague, um, a scientist that he's going to introduce here in just a bit, uh, Dr. Aaron Haker. Am I getting the name right? It's it's Hacker. Hacker, like Dr. Aaron hacker. hacker. I should have asked that before. I'm so sorry. Uh, he's going to uh, give a full introduction for Dr. Uh, hacker here in just a bit, but I had just a few announcements um, before we get started. Um, I do want to thank um, both of our panelists, though, um, uh, for being here with us today and participating. And certainly I want to thank um, Steve for sharing his really amazing artwork. I hope folks come out and see it. Um, we will have a, uh, an event later this week uh, coming up on um, our opening reception on Thursday. Uh, please join us for that at five. Um, we also have a trifold that should be available um, by Thursday with an essay by uh, Dominic Lombardi, um, who who's shown in the gallery before and is a curator and a critic and a um, uh, uh, an artist himself. Um, so do look for that as well. Um, I want to thank Dominic for writing the piece uh, that he wrote for us, but also um, Rich Houck, who helped um, Steve install the work, um, Kate, um, Stephen, John, who's on helping us, um, Kara, all the folks that made um, this exhibit possible, all of our gallery attendants, the Visual Arts Committee members um, that support the work that we do at the Freedmen, and of course, um, all the faculty, administrators, and students who come out to see our show. So thank all of you uh, for the tremendous support that you give to the Freedmen. Um, we're here for you uh, and we thank you for that. So without further ado, um, let me turn now to an introduction of our guest of honor here today, Steve Rossi. Um, Steve received his BFA from Pratt Institute and his MFA uh, from the State University of New York at New Paltz. <clears throat> New Paltz. Um, his work has been exhibited at galleries and museums across the U.S., um, and he's participated in artist residencies at the Vermont Studio Center, Lower Manhattan Cultural Council Council's Arts Center residency on Governor's Island. And in 2022, he was awarded the Sustainable Arts Foundation Fellowship at Gallery Afero in uh, Newark, New Jersey. Um, he's taught part-time at Parsons School of Design, um, as well as the State University of New York at New Paltz and at Westchester Community College. He's currently an assistant professor and um, uh, sculpture program head at St. Joseph University, where he splits his time between Beacon, New York and Philadelphia, PA. So we are super excited to have um, Steve Rossi here and his amazing work. Thank you so much um, for sharing all of that with us. And I will turn it over to you to introduce our, uh, our second esteemed guest today. Thanks so much, David. I uh, really appreciate it. And so I'm, I'm excited when the opportunity to um, exhibit at uh, Friedman Gallery came up and David reached out to me about the possibility of a, a webinar. Um, there's limitations with uh, artist talks in a webinar format, but there's also advantages. And in this case, an advantage was that I was able to reach out to a person whose research I had been referencing as I was informing myself around the issues around groundwater extraction. And I'll, we'll be talking more about that as it goes, but it heavily informs the imagery that I'm working with, the geometry and the compositions. And one of the people that I was, whose um, uh, publications I was uh, citing and referencing was Dr. Aaron Hacker. And so when the webinar opportunity came up, I, I was thinking, you know, this could be a really nice opportunity to have sort of a, an art and science dialogue um, because her, her um, work was sort of informing mine and I was able to work with some of the topics that we're talking about as it relates to natural resource conservation and approach it from a slightly different angle from the way that, um, that um, Dr. Aaron uh, Hacker is is sort of 
approaching data visualization. So uh, with that as a little bit of a setup, I'll I'll go through and um and read read her bio a uh, short bio here. Uh, so Dr. Aaron Hacker is an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and her research involves interdisciplinary collaboration studying the High Plains Aquifer in Texas. She uses models linking groundwater, surface water, economics, and atmosphere, and combines the modeling of groundwater and surface water interactions with statistical data analysis. Her skills include integrating tools such as uh, geographic information systems and Python, a cross-platform open source programming language to improve models. And she's interested in groundwater management, especially in terms of profit and risk. And so that, that gives you a little bit of an introduction into um, Dr. Hacker's research. So I'm really grateful um, again, Aaron, for for you uh, that you're joining us. Um, so the the format that that I was going to um, follow for the talk today is I'll go through and share some images related to kind of how this body of work got started, and um, some of my process images, some of my art historical precedents, um, some of the finished work, and some of the installation uh, views of the current exhibition. And then um, Dr. Hacker is going to share her research with us to kind of fill in the gaps a little bit uh, around like what what these issues are that relate to um, natural resource sustainability around uh, um, the freshwater or groundwater sources in this region that that um, that we're talking talking about here the the southern high plains essentially. So let me let me do the uh, screen share here. And while you're doing that, I'll just remind folks um, for the students that are on, we will have two polls today since this is an experience event. And um, after uh, Steve finishes his section, that'll probably be a great time to launch our first poll. Uh, and then we'll have our second poll after the Q&A uh, ends at the end of today's um, uh, presentation. So this is this first image here is the current uh, current iteration of the the exhibition at the Friedman Gallery, and so you're you'll see a lot of geometry related to uh, circles specifically circles squ squares, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in just a second. Um, but just to get us started, this is this is the landscape that initially got me uh, kind of inspired by kind of thinking about the mechanized mark making in the landscape um, created through gr groundwater pivot irrigation. And so what what that is essentially is um, the the way that the, the process works, the way that industrial agriculture is able to water crops in the arid region around, in this region, this is like Eastern New Mexico and Western Texas, um, very little rain, um, but there is um, a fairly substantial aquifer. And so each of the um, the fields that you'll see have a well that goes into the center of them, uh, that goes into the center of the circle and is drawing upon the groundwater that exists. And that, that groundwater has been in existence there, I think, and um, Aaron will be able to talk to this more specifically, but my understanding is it's left over from the last ice age, essentially. It's been there for like thousands of years, essentially. Um, and so this... This satellite image is the neighborhood that my brother moved to about five to six years ago um, when he was getting, he he had taken a job in the region of Clovis, New Mexico. And so this is his little plot of land here. And if you can believe it, this is actually like 10 acres um, seen from the satellite view. Um, and it's just outside of the swing arm area of like what one of these uh, pivot irrigation arms um, would be able to to do. And so that ends up being sort of the livable space and then the 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 space around that becomes um, productive agricultural land. And so if you were to walk right out the street, this is what you'd see kind of turning left out the front door, just give you an idea of kind of the the landscape and how different it is um, from what we see on the East Coast. Um, and so as a visual person, as an artist, uh, I was really struck by how different the landscape was uh, from from the area that we had grown up around in Western Pennsylvania, which is known for kind of very short, steep hills. Um, and so another thing that you would you would see if you were walking around um, ar around any of the the basically any of the the area here are these um, these pivot irrigation arms. And so these each one of these is about a quarter of a mile wide. Um, and in total, will we'll irrigate a half mile of land as it pivots, and then it pivots around a central central well that's that's uh, pumping out um, groundwater. 
And so when you see it from uh, from more of an aerial view, this is about the the view that you would get if you're flying across the country and you're looking out the plane window from about thirty thousand feet. This is this is similar to like the type of mark making and the color pattern and texture that you would see. And so as a visual person, as a visual artist, I was just completely enamored by just the sheer variety of um, visual information that was so incredibly different from what, what I experience on the East Coast. And it brought up all of these different associations that related to kind of like quilt making. Um, it, it related to painting and drawing traditions around mark making. It related to like the 1960s and 70s um, land art um, um, artistic interventions that uh, that artists and sculptors were doing in the southwestern de desert. So it had all these different associations to it that that I found um, really surprising um, visually and then also art historically. And so just a few of those artistic precedents, Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty. Uh, in the Great Salt Lake. And if you think about the artistic tool that, that's being used here, you know, Robert Smithson is coordinating with um, somebody driving dump trucks, somebody driving a bulldozer, somebody driving a backhoe. Um, and so those become kind of like the, the mechanized versions of like the mark making to facilitate this type of transition in the landscape. Uh, Nancy Holt uh, in her Sun Tunnels project um, was essentially uh, locating these concrete cylinders to frame the sun during the summer and winter solstice. So there's interest in kind of like celestial events as well. Walter De Maria's The Lightning Field, where these stainless steel rods were placed um, in a grid in this in the um, western New Mexico desert. Um, a mile in in a row, a mile a mile in one direction, and then a kilometer in another direction. And so he was interested in in the different ways that um, that space is measured, and sort of how we understand um, the containment of space, essentially. And then these pieces are designed to attract lightning, and so there's there's sort of the further atmospheric connection of like when there is a rainstorm and um, the um, lightning is attracted to the stainless steel rods. So that cut type of intervention um, in the landscape, I, I found uh, really interesting. Michael Heisner's circular planar displacement drawing where he drove a motorcycle around in a circle essentially and created um, created these, these sorts of patterns um, that relate to very similar types of geometry that you would see in um, uh, created through um, groundwater pivot irrigation. And so just to bring it back to like thinking about the artist's hand and the mark making, um, I, my, before I was studying sculpture, I was working, a, my undergrad degree was in painting. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about and looking at kind of just the mark making and the hand of the artist in the work and, and how, that, how that mark was sort of left behind. And so when you start to think about the way that industrial agriculture was altering the landscape from like a really dramatic perspective, that's that's um, on one hand designed to create, um, uh, to, to sort of, uh, to facilitate um, the production of, of food essentially, um, but on a scale of, of, on like an enormous uh, industrial scale that, um, that I just found uh, really surprising the more I learned about it. Um, and then realizing that this is actually like the, uh, and again, Aaron's gonna be speaking more to this more directly, but that the fact that this is actually a, a non-renewable resource in this region. So the groundwater that's being used, um, there's a good chance all, all of the data is pointing to the fact that that aquifer is gonna be fairly well depleted um, probably in the next 50 to 100 years. And so this is, we're looking at kind of like a temporary, um, um, a, a temporary process here. And so when we, when we look at it on, on a sort of a vast scale, zooming out from a satellite image, we can see this is the, the, um, the city that, that my brother had moved to, Clovis, New Mexico. And that image that I was showing you earlier, like the close up is right around here someplace. And then if we back up even more, you can see the way that the groundwater is is making this land, the, the green parts, um, productive, essentially. 
so with all of that, I was trying to think, you know, all of that information, all of that visual information, I was trying to find different ways of like, how could I work with that? How could I explore that? How could I kind of use that as source material in my work? So some of the early um, uh, ex explorations that I did related to just kind of like putting pencil to paper and working on some small scale drawings. And then um, one of the other ways that I was exploring these these ideas was through um, a digital fabrication process where I would take a satellite image, put it into Adobe Illustrator, and then work out the geometry related to um, and, uh, the, the way that the landscape was kind of shaping the, um, or, or the way that the landscape was suggesting uh, potential geom geometric relationships. And so I was thinking about different materials that could be used. And so I, uh, one thing that I was gravitating towards was aluminum um, because it felt like it had a nice connection to the industrialized mechanized uh, processes that were um, um, put into play for industrial agriculture. And so these, these pieces are made through a process, uh, a digital fabrication process called uh, water jet cutting. And for anybody unfamiliar with that, uh, what it is, is um, a, an AutoCAD file. I, I send an AutoCAD file to a, a metal fabricator and um, and there that file will will tell the water jet cutting machine kind of like where where to make the cuts essentially. And so what it's doing is is cutting metal using water at a very high pressure with um, a, a very fine abrasive um, dissolved into it. And so for these pieces, I'm referencing the way that water is impacting the landscape. And then it was important for me to use water in the process of the of the piece as well. And so the titles of these pieces relate to the GPS coordinates of the initial satellite source image. And so a lot of them have titles like a long string of numbers like this, this one here, 34.306766, negative 103.183237. So that's the title of this piece, which really, if you were to type that into um, uh, Google Maps, it would bring up this, uh, a rough area of the source image that, that was used for this piece. And so you can see how I start I was kind of using that as my jumping off point, essentially. And with it, at times, I wasn't necessarily li uh, limiting myself to keeping all of the circles in exact rows. Like if you can see in this one, I stayed pretty true to the way that the, um, the um, pivot irrigation circles were um, arranged in the, in the source image. And then here I started to kind of improvise a bit and take some liberties with it, but just using that as a, a essentially a jumping off point. And then I started kind of working with um, working with color, working working on canvas and incorporating um, another material here, which I used a few times um, in a few pieces, which is a packing blanket. And for me, there was, I'm always sort of thinking about like, the the symbolism between the processes and the materials that are used and then what the overall kind of interest in the concepts are and so in this case thinking about the um, non-renewable nature of the groundwater that's used to um, that's used for industrial agriculture and thinking about the way that the that region is productive in a temporary capacity there's going to be a transition. There was a transition to making it sort of agricultural land, product, productive agricultural land. And then once the aquifer is drained, there'll be a transition back. Um, and so the, the packing blanket for me sort of is that a, a symbol, creates a symbol of that sense of uh, transition. As a packing blanket would be used to kind of cushion your your personal belongings on a on a journey from one one location to another. And part of it had to do with my own sort of family connection of my brother transitioning his life out to that region. It's another another piece where I was using uh, the bare canvas and um, uh, packing blankets again. And then at times um, there is a, a hand embroidery process that I'll talk about in a little bit more. Few of the drawings here, early sketches that would lead to kind of a finalized composition. And then this gives you an idea of the way that the, the paintings, I'm actually using a hand embroidery process where the um, uh, the support, the canvas itself is uh, is utilized to create the embroidery thread. And this piece uses that a little bit more. And you can see the the process here is I'm I'm actually like 
pulling apart the canvas. So I'm taking the support of the painting itself, the canvas, and then deconstructing it essentially, and and then repurposing it for the um, the hand embroidery process. And there's another parallel there that I'm interested in, in the sense that the support of the canvas is being um, uh, I'm extracting parts of the canvas to create the line work that I'm using. And that that I feel like creates an important parallel between kind of the groundwater extraction that's used to make that land productive. And just to give you an idea of how it kind of connects back to the landscape again. So these are all, all these paintings are um, going to be, are that are currently in the Friedman Gallery. And with the, um, the water jet cut aluminum, I was also starting to work with um, you trying to use colors that were referencing the landscape as well. So the aluminum was there as a, a material choice that would parallel the industrial processes where a lot of those pivot irrigation swing arms are fabricated in, in aluminum. And so in this case, the work is kind of um, informed by the industrial processes, but then also by the natural colors in the landscape here as through the addition of um, the acrylic paint that I added to the surface of the aluminum. And then in addition to working out the, um, working through those ideas and those reference points through uh, a painting process, and a drawing process. I, I've also been exploring it through um, a sculptural process, where the the soil of that of that region is used as a material to bring in the color and the texture. Um, and then I've I've created a, a structure here that has a, a circulating water pump in it and a reservoir that it, that allows water to become a visceral part of the experience of the work. So I've got a little a short video here. So the 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 sound of the water trickling sort of starts to fill the gallery space and becomes sort of a very visceral element. And then one of the one of the new projects at the Friedman Gallery is a larger installation where I've I've taken that that the piece that we were just looking at there and I've sort of expanded on it. So this is a um, a small scale model um, of the installation that um that's the, that you'll see in in another um in a slide to come um and then bringing in the soil um as a as a visual design element as well where there's multiple areas where the actual soil is used on the gallery floor so this gives you a little bit of an idea of kind of the uh uh what the installation in the gallery space looks like and then you can see the soil coming in as a as a visual element and also an ephemeral element um, but a, a very dry one, right? So there's there's this contrast between the body of water and then the the dry soil, and so that the, and the different levels um, where those things were existing. So that was kind of those created some important connections. And so that's that that's the extent of my images, and um, and so now we'll, we'll transition over to um, to Aaron Hacker talking a, a little bit more about these groundwater extraction issues from kind of more of a data analysis perspective. Okay, so thank you again for having me. And this is such an interesting way of looking at a groundwater system, right? Because you think about groundwater, I always joke with my students that I don't have any good pictures of the aquifer because it's dark down there. You don't get to see it. <laughs> And that has ramifications for things like groundwater management, groundwater laws, which until the very late 1900s were completely disassociated from surface water regulations, just just utterly divorced. Um, because groundwater, so there's a there's a a great quotation from a, a court case saying that they couldn't possibly regulate groundwater because it is so secret, occult, and concealed that it's simply unknowable. And so we've we've figured out a lot since then. That was from the late 1800s. 
Um, and and we've we've done a lot. So it, a lot of my work is also trying to visualize what's going on in the aquifer, but it it feels abstract in a way that Steve's exhibit, I think, really brings home, like what the system feels like and brings in that third dimension. So it's very exciting, very interesting. So all right, so I'm a I'm a groundwater person, I'm a hydrogeologist, so my background is rocks. And then from there, I started studying water flowing through rocks, and it never gets old. There's always more to learn. So uh, for people who are interested in this, there's a series of papers by this particular author, author group um, led by um, Ben Abbott. Uh, I don't I don't know Bishop, but Jay, Nar Jay Zarnetsky. So these guys um, led this, this author group that has written several papers. Um, essentially focusing on the water cycle for the Anthropocene. So you, you've probably heard the term Anthropocene that geologists are still kind of arguing amongst ourselves whether this is a useful delineation. It's there's a there's a bureaucracy to go through to designate a new geological time step. You can't just declare that, you know, it's not like naming a new species where you put it in the literature and and now it's out there. But it's gained a lot of traction because of this massive impact that humans have had on on water overall. So this isn't focused on groundwater. This is on the whole water cycle. And if you look at the whole water cycle, there this this author team, Abbott et al, um, their their approach to this was looking at water cycle diagrams and realizing that a lot of things that were included in water cycle diagrams were natural processes that are actually a kind of small piece. Like, you know, you would have things like condensation from fog, which is a tiny piece of the overall water budget. Uh, but you would leave out things like agriculture, which is a huge piece of the overall water budget. So the total amount, so this total human water appropriation, this is the amount of water that humans take out of the system or divert for whatever, you know, some of it is for hydropower, a lot of it is for irrigation, a lot of it is for, you know, thermoelectric cooling, things like that. Uh, it's larger in, in magnitude than a lot of natural processes, like notably groundwater recharge. So the amount of water that is making its way into aquifers in the course of a year, um, humans are, are redirecting a a similar quantity of water um, as compared to to that kind of of um, process. So, so I thought I thought you all might get a a kick out of that. <laughs> I guess it's probably the wrong way to put it. Um, but getting into the High Plains Aquifer, so we've we've talked about it as the High Plains Aquifer. Some of you may be more familiar with it as the Ogallala. Uh, there are some books, media that that uh, use the term Ogallala. Uh, but that's a geology term. Most of the water is in uh, a series of geologic formations known as the Ogallala Group. And not all of the water is in that. There's water that's connected in older rocks, younger rocks, rocks that have very different um, histories and uh, different properties, but it's all connected. It all flows from one to the next. And so this High Plains Aquifer term is a hydro term um, that is is more accurate in terms of describing how things are connected. But you'll you'll hear Ogallala aquifer a lot. If you go if you go and try to research more of this stuff, then that's a keyword I definitely recommend. Um, and it's big. This is a big aquifer, right? Uh, so it's outlined in black here on the slide. And this is a um, land cover image that the U.S. Department of Agriculture put out. This is for 2017. They do this every year um, now that we have good satellite data for every year. And you can see that there's a lot of heterogeneity across this very large aquifer, right? But it's very agriculturally um, intensive. So um, this yellow and green up here, so so I'm I'm right about there, if you can see my mouse. Um, in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, and this is a corn soy area. So it's very similar to Iowa and you know these other corn belt states. And then as you go south, here you see more wheat, more 
you know, still some corn, but no soy. There's no more green there, right? Because soy really needs that moisture. And a lot of sorghum. Uh, and as you get further south, you get more wheat, more of that brown. And then down here is cotton. So this area, I'm going to I'm going to show you more of this part of the aquifer, which is which is what Steve was focused on. Um, this is very much um, cotton, wheat, and some corn that you can't really see at this scale. It's it's a bit washed out. You really need a lot of irrigation water to grow corn in this area. But this is this is what we're producing in these regions, right? And as I've got on the slide here. When we talk about water withdrawal from this aquifer, we can talk about irrigation and treat it as synonymous because for all intents and purposes, it is. Very little of this water is going to human consumption, industry, livestock, um, other uses. So if you know about this, this aquifer, it's probably because you've heard about it in the context of depletion. And that's, that's a really big part of the story. Um, since you know, now I'm in Nebraska, and so uh, I want to point out that as you move northward, you lose this strong connection between irrigation and depletion. Um, so down here in the southern high plains in Texas, New Mexico, uh, there's this very strong correlation between irrigation and groundwater decline. And as you move a little further north up here, you're getting cooler overall, right? Our average temperatures are lower, and so there's less evaporation. And also, as you move from west to east, you get wetter. So there's this strong precipitation gradient as well. And so, you know, because the, the southern high plains is just that tiny bit west of the bulk of the northern high plains, it ends up making a fairly large difference, especially in terms of where you can get surface water. And the surface water can also provide irrigation. And so the reason that that connection doesn't hold true up here in eastern Nebraska is that a lot of the irrigation is happening from surface water withdrawals that are actually adding more water to the aquifer. And so we're getting some places actually where we have strong increases in water that is equally equally alarming, but you know maybe uh, less less noticeable in terms of the uh, the the land surface. Um, so over time, with technology, it's become easier and easier to irrigate. And I mean that in a very literal way that in the 30s, if you wanted to irrigate a field, you had to go out there with shovels and physically build these little mini dams that would redirect the water and you had to move pipes by hand. Um, and if you talk with old enough farmers, then they'll tell stories about, you know, that was their summer job, was moving the irrigation pipes back and forth wherever it was needed. And now you don't even have to drive out to the field to turn on a center pivot. Now you can have a smartphone app and you can simply tap a button and you can start or stop your pivots. And so this has, it's made it easier to turn off pivots when it starts raining, but it's also made it, it's lowered the, the bar, the entry for turning on the pivot at any given time. So one of the things that I think, that, that I hope you get out of Steve's pieces is that we talk about aquifer de depletion, but it's often glossed, o glossed over as if you wake up one morning and the aquifer is gone, but that's not really how it happens. It Think of it more as if your water pressure is going down gradually. And so with the center pivots, the result of that is that, you know, imagine one of those center pivots that's moving around in space, right? Um, but it's also, you know, there's a temporal element here. And so if you are watering with very low water pressure, you have to have that pivot parked in a certain spot for a while in order to get enough water to the crops that are directly underneath which means that by the time you get all the way around that field, the crops that you watered first have turned into dust because you were taking too long to get them water again. And so that's one of the reasons that you see these, these half pivot circles, or you might see these donuts where uh, maybe you have enough water pressure that you can irrigate the whole circle, but not for the whole length of the pivot. 
And so you, you have these really interesting patterns that are the result of having this expensive infrastructure in place to allow you to irrigate in the first place that you have invested in, that you have gotten loans to purchase and install, and now you don't have enough water pressure to irrigate a full crop. And so uh, there has been a volume reduction in this aquifer. You know, we, we are um, draining it. We, as a, as a humanity, um, we are causing much of this to go, much of this resource to go dry, but the overall reduction in volume is only about 10%. The issue is that that 10% volume reduction has happened where there was less water to begin with, and there are fewer other backup resources. If you wanna think of surface water as being what you turn to um, on a regular basis, and then if you have a dry year, there's no surface water, then you pump. That's kind of how we operate in Nebraska. Uh, but in the Southern High Plains, you either pump to sustain your crop which you, is what you do on a regular basis, or it's really hot and dry and you pump as much as you possibly can. And you know, you're know you making up for precipitation rather than making up for surface water. There's no alternatives. The, the groundwater is the primary resource and the backup. Um, and so one of the things that is really interesting here in this graph, if you look at this over time, and you know, like I said, this, this only represents about a 10% drop in the overall aquifer, but two thirds of the water in the High Plains aquifer is in Nebraska, where we haven't had significant declines. And so that's buffering the overall numbers. So there's a couple interesting things here, one of which is that there was very little decline from the mid 1970s to the mid 1990s. And so sometimes people notice that and they say, hey, what were we doing here? We must have been doing something right because the, the aquifer stopped declining. And it turns out that that was the 1980s farm crisis. And there were simply a lot of irrigators going bankrupt and having their, their farms foreclosed on. And when you suggest that to regulators, they do not approve. And farmers also, for some reason, if you tell them that what needs to happen is a bunch of people need to lose their farms and be foreclosed on, it's not a popular message. I don't, I, I don't know what to tell you. But then in the 1990s, you may be surprised to learn that, you know, here you see this very, very steep decline, right? So what happened then? Okay, well, what happened then actually was the onset of much more efficient irrigation practices. And there's still a conversation in, in hydrogeology and in hydrologic engineering about the idea that we need to improve um, uptake of these efficient irrigation practices because there's an unstated assumption that people are going to become more efficient and therefore use less water. But it doesn't work that way. So there's this, this idea that's been around for 150 years or so from economics uh, that this guy William Jevons observed first in the context of coal, where you could do more per unit coal in as the industrial revolution ramped up and so people thought okay well uh the demand for coal is going to go down but the demand for coal didn't go down it went up because if you can do more with a resource then you're going to want more of it not less of it and so what happens is when you can irrigate more efficiently this is things like these drop nozzle irrigation um, uh, nozzles so these are, are dangling from a center pivot and they're getting water much more directly to the root zone where the crops need it. And so you don't need as much water pressure because you're not running a sprinkler that's shooting water into the air and losing 50% of it. You're delivering it directly to the crop. And now if you only have 600 gallons per minute, which would be a typical well yield in, in that area of Texas, um, now you can go from irrigating an entire or irrigating only a half circle to now irrigating your entire circle again. So we've seen this enormous increase in water demand as a result of this supposed attempt to limit the declines in the High Plains aquifer, which is a very interesting kind of dynamic um, that that is still not 
hasn't really steeped into popular understanding as well among the crowds that I tend to run with. Um, maybe we're just missing something. The economists get it, you know. Um, so then we, you know, if we look at when exactly the aquifer might go dry, it's it's different in different places, right? But down here, Texas, New Mexico, it's important to note, I think, that there are some places that are typically defined as being part of the aquifer that actually never had water. They're connected rocks. If there were water, you know, if, if suddenly we started getting a meter of rain every year in New Mexico, absolutely there would be an increase in saturation and that water would be connected with the rest of the aquifer. Um, but but these areas were never were never wet. Uh, these these few little uh, nubs that are kind of around the the edges of the aquifer, but there's a very strong escarpment there that separates it from the rest of the surrounding landscape, and so people throw it in with the aquifer. So this area um, and Clovis is is right around here ish. Um, this area of the southern high plains had the most groundwater out of any part of the Southern High Plains. And that is where uh, the depletion has been concentrated. And that's where there are a lot of places that are probably already done. You saw some places where there clearly had been center pivots, but they weren't watering. And sometimes you can follow a field and then try again next year, but they're already on their way out. And then there are there are quite a few places where if trends continue, which is an important caveat, um, then we may see depletion within the next 30 to a 30 to 50 years. Um, and this this slide refers to a, a, a get together um, called the Ogallala Summit that I attended in 2018. And they had people from every state in the High Plains speak. And it was really striking because the Nebraska person got up and spoke first. And he said, you know, we really need to start talking about water quality because water quantity, really, we're in good shape. Things are fine. And then the person from Kansas got up and said, really, I think we have a path forward for sustainability. I'm very optimistic. It's it's going to maybe take some some smart messaging and and sacrifice, but we can do it. And then the person from Texas literally got up and his first words were, you know, everything dies. <laughs> Life is short. <laughs> it's inevitable. <laughs> so there's a lot of a lot of planned depletion in in Texas. Uh, there's there's enough resistance to uh, to any kind of conservation measure. And how do you water only a little? In, in this environment, you saw how dry it is. How, how do you can't water, you can water half a crop, you know, half a circle, but you can't simply put on six inches of water in a year and hope it doesn't make money. And that's what's driving this system. So speaking of which, all right, so this is a completely conceptual diagram. There is no number on this diagram. This is not, the, the magnitudes are imaginary. This is This is how I see things. OK, so we have two overlapping curves. One is yellow and one is blue. And where they overlap, it's green so that you can see where they you can see both of them. Right. And so the argument is that if we keep using water like we are currently, then we're going to lose a lot of profit over time. And if you remember your calculus, the overall profit that we're getting is the area under this curve. And the area under the yellow curve is less than the area under the blue curve right? Uh, which represents conservation. So if we start conserving, we're going to eventually still maybe run out of water, but we can extend that, that watering ability. We can extend that irrigation quite a long time compared to our current trajectory. But then if you think about, you know, we are, we are riding along in the present. And if we were to adopt a lot of conservation measures, then maybe we would see our immediate profits drop. This is the part that people can't abide, is the idea that in order to get their overall profit maximized, they would have to delay those profits substantially. And farmers will always say that 
you know, if you want me to be in business in 50 years, I have to be in business next year. And it's, it's honestly kind of hard to argue against that. Uh, so that's what I want to talk about. I mean, I've I've spent 10 years studying this. I can talk about it literally all day. I have, but I don't want to subject you to it. I want to leave time for questions so that if there's any aspect of it that anyone's interested in, we can focus on that. But I do want to point out that I work with a million people and they're all very smart. And, you know, it's not just me out here as the lone voice talking about depletion. Um, so with that, thank you again so much for having me. This is such a pleasure to to see this in a different... Uh, okay, I'll, I'll let you all uh, <laughs> talk about your art. I won't well, talk about your art for you. Thank, thank you, Aaron. Really, really helpful. And, and right at the end of your talk, I was almost jumping in and uh, I was going to ask, uh, you know, if if the withdrawals were to stop right now and the aquifer was to recharge what it's what i've read is that it's it's like six to eight thousand years for that water to filter back into the landscape because it's such a a dry arid climate potentially but actually there's something really exciting that i didn't talk about at all this is stuff that i haven't quite gotten around to publishing yet there's oh my zoom is is just in the worst spot all right um well i'll i'll just you know what? I'm just going to keep it not in the slide view because it's being a pain. Okay. So we have this massive drop. This is this lower panel is what you've seen before. We have this massive drop in water levels. And then we have this flat line and then we have this even steeper decline. So this top panel is really the same data, but it's looking at the area where the groundwater is is estimated to be at the surface, according to my estimates, my, my water table interpolations. Um, and you see this massive drop in the 1930s, and then it kind of stabilizes. But you actually see some significant increase in this groundwater surface water connection um, during that 1980s farm crisis. And that suggests to me, it's not definitive, this is very preliminary, but it suggests to me that maybe if we were to stop irrigating, we might not get the storage that we had in the early 1900s, but we might start getting stream flow again the, mm -hmm. from springs much more quickly than, than I would have expected personally. Um, so if I go back to this slide, oh no, okay. I know on one slide, you could see some of the, um, some of the, the surface water that had originated in the Southern High Plains at one time and has been dry for a hundred years. Uh, oh, maybe I was hallucinating. Um, in any case, the, the surface water connection is really important because when groundwater is just sitting underground, it's not, there's no fish, right? There's no, there's no habitat that it's supporting, but when it reaches the surface, that's great for habitat because it's colder than the water that comes from runoff and it is cleaner and it's more reliable when it's there. Um, and so there are times when a lot of streams, especially in the West are fed entirely by groundwater. And so if we could restore some of that habitat, I feel like that's much closer to people's hearts in terms of conservation. And yet the conservation story that we all hear is about what boils down to money. You know, why save the Southern High Plains? You know, why save this, this resource? Well, if you look at the, the effects that saving it would have, it would keep farmers in business. And I think most environmentalists would say, wait, you know, that's, that's not what we're after. What we're after is, you know, saving whooping cranes, saving sturgeons, saving all of these other endangered species. Well, you don't get that from saving the Southern High Plains. You actually get it from maintaining these high groundwater levels where you still have this connection with the surface. Hmm. So if we only need a little con conservation to get back to springs in Kansas and Texas, that's very exciting to me from an environmentalist standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one, th one thing that I find helpful to just sort of bring these ideas home, because we, you know, we're on the East Coast and we're talking about a scenario that exists in the, the, uh, the Great Plains region of the country. And sometimes that can feel very far away. But one thing that I, that I remember and that I think about quite often when I'm doing this work is that, you know, for anybody that's wearing a pair of blue jeans that are made out of cotton, 
uh, for anybody that's eating a burger, um, for anybody that's enjoying a bowl of, of cornflakes, like those are all the products. That's what's produced in the region. And our consumption of those products is essentially tying us to that, even though that's existing, you know, 2000 miles away from, from where, where I live. That's, that's a point where we're all kind of tethered to that because of the nature of the economy. Um, and that after with all of the the data that you just shared with us, Aaron, I I um I have a land acknowledgement statement prepared um that I that I feel like now is kind of a good time to share it, just because with that data in mind, it sort of draws a contrast between the way that native peoples lived on the land um for thousands of years before um before European colonization. So I just wanted to acknowledge. The area of the Great Plains region referenced in, in my body of work has been the traditional homeland of the Kiowa, the Mescalero Apache, the Comanche, the Lipan Apache people. And native people have stewarded the land in the Great Plains region for thousands of years prior to European colonization, sustaining relationships with water sources so different from the non-renewable extractive practices currently in use today. Um, so should we... Do you have anything else that you wanted to add, Aaron, before we um, jump into questions? No, I, I see that there there is one question uh, that's open at the moment, and I can jump into that. Or David, if you need to put up the next uh, poll. Yeah, let's go ahead and, and do some Q&A, and then we can do our poll at the end. Um, everybody can hear me, correct? Yeah. All right. So let me just read this question. Uh, uh, it says, how is the industry, non-governmental organizations, and governments tackling this issue in order to make progress to lessen the harm that will result with depletion or stop it entire, entirely? Is there any alternative source of water? I imagine that shipping water would be difficult. So what can be done? Well, it's very tricky. And this is 452,000 square kilometers. And it's a lot of different governments because the federal government doesn't get involved. The federal government, other than um, cross boundary disputes, which have always been surface water so far, um, you know, things that cross state boundaries will get adjudicated by the Supreme Court. But other than that, the federal government doesn't regulate groundwater um, and, and doesn't regulate water most of the time in general, except some water quality. So, well, so you have state governments, and in Nebraska, we have more local governments, uh, local, somewhere in between state and county level, called the Natural Resources Districts. And the Natural Resources Districts are charged with managing both groundwater and surface water simultaneously, which in the 70s, when they were set up, was a big deal. And this has since spread, um, you know, this... This recognition happened a lot a long time before action did, um, but now there is much more recognition around managing the two as a single resource, uh, which is great. So in terms of actually doing anything, well, attitudes have changed substantially even in the last 30 years. So in 1951, the first groundwater management district was set up in Texas in this this area that has seen very deep declines. And um, the purpose of that groundwater district was to prevent the state from coming in and doing any regulating or collecting any data or doing anything whatsoever that would interfere with farmers because they did not want to be told not to water their crops. This is my land and I own the water underneath it and I can pump as much as I want and that's what I'm going to do. And that's what the state statutes allow. Um, other states have stricter regulations. They have systems like first in time, first in right, which, you know, speaking of issues with tribes, if you want to get into the really interesting first in time, first in right conversations, look up what's happening with the Colorado River Basin and um, the Diné, the Navajo, trying to get their water rights recognized because everyone agrees that they have the first water right, but no one agrees how much it is. And so none of it is protected because everyone refuses to quantify it. So <laughs> leaving that aside, um, so there are different groups that have different 
uh, motivations is the short answer. And some of them are working very hard to try to push conser conservation. And some of them are working very hard to try to prevent conservation. But there are a lot more people now on the conservation side. There's a lot of interesting sociological research, um, including from uh, uh, a guy named Matthew Sanderson. So if I can, uh, I can only chat to webinar folks. If you're interested in that, reach out to me. My my email address is just hacker at my last name at unl.edu. Um, and Sanderson and Lauer did some interesting work with uh, surveys of farmers. And, and when you look at survey results from the 70s, the 90s, and now far more people say things like, we should preserve the aquifer. In the 70s and, and the 90s, people didn't even agree about that. It was very much, you know, no, we should we should use it or lose it, man. Because if I don't use it, then someone else is going to. Um, and there are far more people um, who think that conservation should be happening. But by and large, people say this is a community problem, not a personal problem, not me. Even though I'm the one with my hand on the tap, it's not my problem. And when asked, are you already doing as much as you can? The answer is yes, a resounding yes. I am doing as much as I can to save water. You know, the people who are doing the irrigating do not consider stopping irrigating to be something that is within their power to do because of the other largely economic forces that they're facing. So it's hard. It's not easy. It's it's a lot of people. It's a lot of livelihoods. Um, pallid sturgeon and some of the other species that are affected by these things. In some places, they're already gone. So people don't worry about them and where they still are around, they're not particularly cuddly. So it's hard to make the argument that, you know, you, yes, you should lose your livelihood because of this ugly fish. There's not enough of them. So it's, it's tricky. It is, it is tricky too. And in, in, in the sense of like, what can the individual person do where it's like, even if we're conserving the water that we're using, say in the shower or with the toilet, not with 94% of 97% of the aquifer water going to industrial agriculture, it's sort of like uh, human consumption, even cities and towns are just such, such a small percentage of that water use. Right. So I tell my students that if you, you know, if you run the, the tap while you're brushing your teeth, yeah, you'll make a difference and it'll be a local difference, which is nice. But if you let meat go bad in the back of your fridge, you know, let some beef go bad in particular, that is a huge amount of water that you have just wasted. And that is far more water waste than you would have wasted if you had made sure to, to consume that food and run the tap when you brush your teeth, you know. It's such a, it's such a, such a small component of our water footprint. Um, when we think about things other than the products and, you know, yeah, the blue jeans, the beef, the things that we bring into our homes. I have a question for Steve, not to turn it away from the conservation aspect, but I'm interested, you know, what, from an artist perspective, what you think drawing attention to this subject does in terms of impact and how that message here can translate to the folks that really need to hear it. Um, so I know that's kind of a, a weird way to ask that question, but um, I think hopefully, do you understand what I'm getting yeah. at? Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so like my, I think my interest in the question in in this question in general with the with the work right like what's the agency of the work and what impact can an art, artist really have with with what they're doing right and so i come sort of thinking about the capacity that an artist has to be socially engaged environmentally engaged i think that there's a um an artist has a, a unique position to be able to um draw attention to topics draw attention to issues that maybe are um, not being discussed or not being discussed in the in a context that um, that we feel like they could be or that there's more potential for those questions to be explored. 
Um, and so for me specifically, what I'm interested in drawing attention to is actually a, a value system that's in place um, that allows us to feel like it's a rational decision to completely um, extract an existing natural resource. And as Aaron put it, the aquifer is the primary water source and it's the backup water source in that, in those regions. And so the, the, the logic that that is actually um, a, a, a good decision to be making, I think is it's a value judgment, right? And it's a, it's a cultural value judgment. Um, and so the, the aesthetic sensibility that I try to bring to the work is, is, is one that my, my hope is that there's a, a first sort of a visceral aesthetic engagement with the work, but then a, sort of a larger questioning of like, why does, why does this work exist in this way? And why does, why does this condition exist in the world in this way? And so now we start talking about like our economic structure. We start talking about kind of a capitalist value system. Uh, and we start talking about um, non-renewable resources. Um, and and that's, um, that's a bigger question. And I feel like uh, an artist is able to have a unique place in, in society, essentially, to draw attention to those questions, essentially. Thank you for that answer. We do have another question here that I'll, I'll get to. I do want to say, though, just about that, the last question that I asked, it was a little self-serving because I do teach a first-year seminar class where we're really looking at how artists do impact um, you know, society, societal issues, political issues, all of that. And the reason I, I wanted to draw attention to that is in this day and age where we have um, seen over the last few years a uh, um, degradation in our trust of, you know, journalism and what we read in the paper, and even the courts now are being questioned. Um, I feel like artists and museums, and there have been studies about this as well, are one of the last bastions, um, you know, libraries, museums, artists, uh, who really still have the public's trust about these issues. So I do think it's super important to continue this work. Um, and I really appreciate your addressing it. So let's um, move to the, the next question, uh, which is for Steve. It says, um, is there any other environmental or social issues that you have an interest in depicting artistically? And do you have any other past work that depicts other issues? Uh, the answer uh, to all of those points would be absolutely yes. Um, if And if you go to my website, uh, steverossisculpture.com, I've got a number of different bodies of work highlighted. Um, and they, they're they either socially engaged or they're environmentally engaged in, in different ways. Um, there was one project that I did recently that related to uh, this, the history of the city of Philadelphia and um, kind of coincidentally, right around like 2019, 2020, I had gotten started on three different bodies of work that all related to water in one way or the other. And so it was just an interesting um, kind of confluence of events, I guess, that brought those things together. So there's there's one project called uh, that you'll see on my website called the Fairmount Waterworks Project. And I started that right at the beginning of the pandemic in response to a, a call for public art um, that would engage the history of Fairmount Waterworks Park in Philadelphia. Um, and, and there's an interesting history there where the, the water, the public infrastructure of water in Philadelphia was um, essentially developed uh, as a response to the yellow fever uh, epidemic of 1793. And um, at the time, they thought that yellow fever was spread by contaminated drinking water. Um, later on, they found out that it was spread by mosquitoes, um, but there was an effort to try to bring clean water from the Schuylkill River um, to city residents. So a whole pumping um, station was set up and a whole plumbing system was put in place um, to pump water from the Schuylkill River into um, Center City, Philadelphia. And starting this at the, at the beginning of the, the coronavirus pandemic was really interesting to see the way that this public works infrastructure project created the impetus for um, a, a, co um, a consensus um, around a public works infrastructure project. Whereas at the time, it seemed like at the time, there was a lot of um, 
a, a lot of confusion and a lot of opposition to say a, a larger um, effort to fight the coronavirus. And so I just thought looking at a different historical era, it, it created a really interesting kind of social and historical kind of parallel in that project. Um, and so that project was explored through augmented reality and then also through a um, a, a collage, hands-on collage project in a public art context. But you could find that on the website. There's some other projects on there too that um, that you could definitely look at for um, social and, and um, environmental um, projects. Um, I actually got a uh, a text on my phone um, with another question. So folks, I, I guess maybe had a hard time trying to get into the Q&A, uh, but this one is uh, for Dr. Hacker. Um, is there any research that you've done in relation to climate change also that could be affecting um, some of the results that we're seeing with the aquifer as well? So that's a great question. Um, I do not do climate research. Well, I've collaborated a little bit with climate scientists. The thing is that it's it's not going to get better. But the places where it's likely to get hotter and drier are the places where it's already dry and hot. And those places don't need any help to deplete the aquifer, really. Um, and in Nebraska, in the northern high plains, where, again, two-thirds of the water is, what we're actually expecting to see is fewer rainfall events and more intense rainfall. And that can lead to a reduction in the amount of water that gets to the aquifer. Because if you think about it, you know, you pour a bucket of water on the ground and a lot of that is going to run off, right? It'll find its way to a storm drain or something. But if you trickle some water on the ground over a much longer time period, it's much more likely to sink in if there's any opportunity for it to do so. It's not going to overwhelm the infiltration capacity is the, the technical term. And so you may get more water from a rain event that's that's short and intense that goes to streams rather than staying put long enough to trickle into the aquifer. Um, but it's probably not a huge difference. It's, 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 we know so little about how much water is making it to the aquifer in the first place. It's really hard to observe um, because you have to do things like bury sensors that will tell you the soil moisture or or even just the weight of the water in the soil um, to see how much water is getting down to different soil depths. It's very expensive, time consuming, labor intensive. Um, and so and and also only applies to that little spot. And you've also disturbed that spot now. <laughs> so figuring out how much water is actually getting to the aquifer is tough in the first place. So to figure out then, you know, what proportion of, of change is going to happen from climate change, the over the uncertainty kind of overwhelms the actual signal. So there are people who have looked into it and the, the basic, uh, so, so what I said first, it's not going to get better. That's basically the, the scientific consensus at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's it's ongoing. There's a lot of there's a lot of interesting questions to answer at different spatial scales and temporal scales. Thank you both. Thank you so much, both of you, for um, a really enlightening presentation today. Thank you, Steve, for bringing attention to this and and inviting Dr. Hacker to show as well. Uh, share her experience and knowledge. We thank you both so much. Speaking of questions, we'll ask our last poll um, so we can pop that up as we start to say our goodbyes. And uh, we thank everybody for their attention today uh, and good questions, good conversation. Um, really appreciate it. And we hope everyone comes out to see this amazing work in the Friedman Gallery.
Thank you.